we know that community pharmacies are visited more often than any other healthcare provider. Up to 35 times a year, a, a Medicare beneficiary probably goes to their community pharmacy. And how many times do they go to their provider? Maybe three in the course of a year. So there's a lot of information that that pharmacist and the pharmacy team could be providing back to the provider. If we were able to get blood sugars, if they could do hemoglobin A1C testing, I know that some pharmacies are actually starting to even do diabetic retinal screens and be able to feed that back. Those are all important data points that could help close gaps in care that matter to the clinicians. Welcome to the Pharmacy Quality Solutions Quality Corner Show, where quality measurement leads to better patient outcomes. This show will be your go-to source for all things related to quality improvement and medication use in healthcare. We will hit on trending health topics as they relate to performance measurements and find common ground for payers and practitioners. We will discuss how the Equip platform can help you with your performance goals. We will also make sure to keep you up to date on pharmacy quality news. Please note that the topics discussed are based on the information available at the date and time of recording. Information or guidelines are updated periodically, and we will always recommend that our listeners research and review any guidelines that are newly published. Buckle up and put your thinking cap on. The Quality Corner Show starts now. Hello, Quality Corner Show listeners. Welcome back to the PQS podcast, where we focus on medication use, quality improvement, and how we can utilize pharmacists to improve patient health outcomes. I'm your host, Nick Dorich, and on today's show, we are continuing to talk about healthy aging and geriatric care. Providing patient care for geriatric patients or for healthy aging can be difficult. As we've covered in prior episodes, there are changes for treatment that will occur as we age, and in addition, patient care may become a bit more complicated than normal with caregivers and family members that can also be involved. Add to that a growing team of care providers, and we can create a situation that could be multifaceted, yet also confusing for that patient. So for today's podcast, we are bringing in a guest to help us learn about integrated care in geriatric pharmacy. Our guest is Sean Jeffrey, PharmD and board certified geriatric pharmacist. Sean, welcome to the show. Thank you, Nick. It's a pleasure to join you. Excellent. Well, to get us started for today's episode, we need to hear about you, Sean. What is your background with healthcare and pharmacy, and what do you actively do now? So like many people, I was born at a very early age, but I had no clue I was going to go into pharmacy at that point. I was practicing in uh, high school as an EMT and riding on our town's ambulance. And through that opportunity, I came to realize that I really enjoyed working with older adults. The little old lady who fell out of her bed in the nursing home, and I brought her to the hospital, and she talked my ear off all the way in, became something that was very close to my heart. Uh, I've always had a fondness for uh, grandparents and for seniors. So that's kind of what led me down that path in healthcare towards eventually becoming a geriatric pharmacist. I did my undergraduate at the University of Connecticut and then my PharmD training at Ohio State. And after I left Ohio, I did a geriatric pharmacy residency with Joe Hanlon and Christine Ruby at the Durham VA and Duke Center for Aging. So I really took that deep dive into geriatric pharmacy. And it's, you know, I got some advice early in my career that, you know, think about where you're going to be when you're in mid-career and what the world might look like at that point. And somebody showed me a graph of the aging population in the country and just the explosion of seniors that were going to be uh, facing. They used to call it the silver tsunami. But, you know, we have more people turning 65 every single day than in any other time in history. You know, in, in the entire history of mankind, two thirds of all the men and women who have ever lived to the age of 65 are currently alive today. So that gives you some context of how many people out are out there that are you know, over the age of 65. And there's nothing magical about that age. But, you know, as, as PQS listeners are probably familiar and and CMS certainly knows, you know, that's when you qualify for your benefits for, for CMS, right, for Medicare. 
I don't know what happens at uh, age uh, 64 and 364 days and 23 hours, you know, but that one hour difference makes you uh, able to qualify for these different uh, benefits. So, uh, you know, I got interested in working with seniors. I was a pharmacy student. They were telling me, you know, seniors have more medications. It'll be job security. And it has really been great advice. And I've loved the career ever since. So, you know, I started... My initial practice was in the VA system, and I spent 15 years at VA Connecticut, where I did pretty much everything in geriatrics. I was jack of all trades, uh, consulting, doing home-based primary care, geropsychiatry, working on pain management, started a geriatric residency program down there. And about six years ago, I transitioned uh, to become the director of pharmacy for Hartford Healthcare's Integrated Care Partners, which is their value-based clinically integrated delivery network. And in that role, I'm responsible for population health pharmacy strategy, uh, overseeing the pharmacy quality measures for CMS, and uh, making sure that uh, we provide pharmacy solutions for an integrated care management team. Sean, thanks for the quick rundown on your, your history and the part that I take away. You've played a number of different roles as it relates to geriatric care, which I think speaks just to the complexity as we're trying to manage these patients and uh, the many, many opportunities there and that that change as we age. So we're going to cover a lot of those items, some of them that are the more germane topics, others like the word as far as the gerio psychiatry that we're going to get into. I want to ask some questions about that as well. Uh, but before we do, we're going to take a moment to stop and let's hear the breakdown. Now it's time for the breakdown. As Quality Corner show host, Nick will ask three main topic questions. Our guests will have a chance to respond and there will be some discussion to summarize the key points. This process will repeat for the second and third questions, which will wrap up the primary content for this recording. After that, expect to end on a closing summary, usually containing a bonus question. Now that we have described the process, let's jump into the questions. All right, Sean, let's go ahead and dive into our first topic for today. PQS is continuing a month-long discussion on geriatric care and healthy aging. You are going to bring a unique perspective as we talk about, quote unquote, integrated care. The, the simple definition of this to me is providers working together as a collective system to improve care for patients. In this case, in particular, it's that older patient. With that as the background, what is integrated healthcare for a geriatric patient and what examples of this care model can you currently point to? So Nick, older adults are a complicated lot. They use more medications than any age group, have more chronic illness than any age group, cost more to care for than any age group. And in fact, the last six months of somebody's life is probably the most expensive part of their healthcare overall. So Recognizing the complexities of caring for older adults requires that we also acknowledge that there are often many cooks in this kitchen. And the care can become very complicated and fragmented very quickly. And it's often at a point in somebody's life where they can't deal with those complexities as easily as they might have when they were younger. So therefore, integrating the care means coordinating care first and foremost. And, and we like to focus on that in the ambulatory space. We use care coordinators such as nurses and social workers, but you could also see community health aides or other paraprofessionals to get involved in helping to coordinate that care. Uh, sometimes they talk about healthcare navigators to assist with access issues. But ultimately, this is to assure that older adults are able to access the care that they need, that the care is being coordinated across the number of providers that they have, and that the goals of care are established and shared with the team. And that last piece is really important because establishing goals of care is critical in older adults because that's what's going to drive what the future state will look like. What are we going to do as the illness advances or as things change? You know, What is their goal? What are they hoping to get out of this? And there are many places where this type of care coordination exists. I'm going to give you a, a one example, which is a very long-standing example out there, and that's called PACE programs. These are programs for all-inclusive care in the elderly, and they have specific eligibility requirements, but you know what they are at their heart is a highly integrated 
care team that does whatever it takes to keep that senior in as safe a, a situation as possible at home and deliver the care to them where they need it. So examples would be, you know, if you had somebody who had respiratory illness and they might have to go to a nursing home because their apartment is too hot and they can't breathe there, they'll try to get them an air conditioner so they can stay home as long as they can. And these types of programs like PACE have shown that they can really result in overall lower cost of care and significantly improved um, patient satisfaction scores. Another example that is, is becoming a lot more popular in the type of example where I actually practice in is using a care management team. So in our system at Hartford Healthcare, we have a team of nurses and social workers and two pharmacists that are assigned a panel of patients. This panel is typically identified based on population. So for example, it might be a Medicare Advantage population that we're helping to co-manage, or it could be a risk based population where you have high risk patients that you are going to be uh, following. So they may have multiple admissions, readmissions, emergency room visits, et cetera. And that care team then coordinates the care in and amongst the different providers so that the patient feels that they have somebody that they can go to, somebody they can call who understands what's going on with their care and also has the ability to break down the barriers of communication for that person and get access to the other members of the care team. That involves potentially scheduling appointments. It may involve getting a pharmacist like myself involved to review medications, to provide recommendations. It might involve getting transportation services. So all of these are facets of integrated care and it's because of, again, the complexity of care that seniors have that they need that added level of support, somebody that can be the glue that helps keep things together. Sean, it's interesting to me because as you give the response, all the work that goes into it, there were different. There were a couple different elements you mentioned that are specifically related to the medication, but more so it's about the access to care and just the scheduling appointments, transportation, because ultimately, you know, as, as it's been said, medications don't work and people don't take them. Medication or an action plan doesn't work in a patient for a patient that can't access it either. Um, I do want to talk a little bit, though, and just see from your perspective where does a community pharmacist, you know, fit in with this? Because they're going to be they're going to be a part of the care team. They're not going to be the focus of it or even the quarterback in that care team. But you know, if you're working with a patient that is going to be discharged to home or going back to their community, what's your follow up like with a community pharmacist? Or maybe maybe we're not there yet, where it's that full on you know exchange of you know data and communications. But what would you like to see that as? So I can give you what is the current state and what might be a future state version. Uh, first, I would say that the community pharmacist is, is a vital uh, connection point for the care that's being delivered. But it's a connection point that's not fully integrated into the workflows and the communication streams for care managers and the rest of the providers in the system. And that's largely because they operate outside of the communication that may be occurring within the electronic health record. Until we get that bi-directional communication, we have pharmacists contributing to care plans and contributing to messaging back and forth beyond just faxing prior authorizations or whatever the challenge they might be trying to adjudicate a prescription uh, to the electronic medical record and to the providers, they will be somewhat set apart from what is happening in the, the broader context of care management. Now, where I think that there's a big role for them, though, is in helping to assure that the meds that somebody is getting are accurate, are safe, are effective, and that they're actually being taken as prescribed. We have a lot of quality measures, as you know, around medication adherence, and those community pharmacists can play a big role in helping to improve the overall adherence to the treatment plan. It would be ideal if they're part of that treatment plan, it can have some ability to weigh in and to provide context to whether or not somebody's being adequately managed, you know, that could be as simple as providing some blood pressure readings in the pharmacy back to the clinician on the off visits when the patient's not going to the doctor's office. We know that community pharmacies are visited more often than any other healthcare provider. 
up to 35 times a year, a, a Medicare beneficiary probably goes to their community pharmacy. And how many times do they go to their provider? Maybe three in the course of a year. So there's a lot of information that that pharmacist and the pharmacy team could be providing back to the provider. If we were able to get blood sugars, if they could do hemoglobin A1C testing, I know that some pharmacies are actually starting to even do diabetic retinal screens and be able to feed that back. Those are all important data points that could help close gaps in care that matter to the clinicians. So whereas our current state is that the pharmacists are still somewhat siloed from the team, I can see a future state where we have value-based reimbursements and we have pharmacists able to contribute meaningfully in a bi-directional way to the communication that's happening within the team. And they're also helping to then close gaps in care, bring value to the overall care picture, and really helping to improve the overall quality while reducing cost of care. Thanks for the response, Sean. I, I think it's important how you framed it, the current state where we are now, because that's the realistic, hey, this is what occurs here and now. But we want to move pharmacy forward. We want to move, more importantly, patient care forward. Pharmacy is an important aspect of that. And you did a nice job of laying out for us what that roadmap can look like. What are going to be some of the, I would say, requirements for pharmacy to participate and play in that space? Um, and I think it's very much kind of a, a chicken and the egg scenario. Does pharmacy build it? Do we wait for payers and other systems to come to us? Uh, we need to figure that part out so we can really advance patient care. But can, can I add one thing to that, Nick? Absolutely. There, there are pharmacies and pharmacy networks out there that are figuring this out. I would highlight one example, and I'm not trying to select you know, just one out of many different groups that are out there, but the CPESN network, which is the Community Pharmacy Enhanced Service Network that started out in North Carolina and has evolved nationally now. They are, I would think, an example of pharmacists at the front line, cutting edge, trying to demonstrate their value through potential contracts with health systems that would allow them to be in that pay for play environment where they can show that the work that they're doing brings value, they should be rewarded for it, and overall will reduce the cost of care. So it's happening. We just need it to accelerate. Yeah, the acceleration part will be key. Now, um, I do want to move to our second question, and let's address a little bit more about what exactly a geriatric pharmacist does. And this may seem like it's something coming from a, a maybe a career fair that you attended when you were a student for our listeners, but uh, I think it's important consideration because, Sean, as you mentioned at the beginning, we've got more and more of an aging population that brings more complexities and more opportunities for pharmacists that work in the space. So what just very plainly, what does a geriatric pharmacist do? Is this something that's locked into settings like rehabilitation or um, skilled nursing facilities, hospice? What what are geriatric pharmacists doing here and now? So, Nick, let me ask you, have you ever had to care for seniors? Myself, not directly, but I have, in the course of my time as a pharmacy, have spent time working in you know APPEs and doing some of the other care, and then, of course, in a pharmacy to that extent. So then you're a senior care pharmacist, right? We can make it a very expansive definition. If you care for seniors, I would consider you a geriatric pharmacist. Now, obviously, it's a little bit more nuanced than that. Um, you know, and I'll take the, the larger view of, of the topic here. I was president of the American Society of Consultant Pharmacists in 2012 and 13. And when I was president, I strongly advocated for changing the name of the organization to America's Senior Care Pharmacists because the American Society of Consultant Pharmacists, I thought, was too defined by a practice setting, which for many in that world was senior care is skilled nursing facilities, assisted living facilities, short-term rehab facilities, and, and that type of environment. And those are where many geriatric pharmacists work, but I would argue that it's much more broad than that. But there is a unique skill set that a geriatric pharmacist brings to the management of an older adult, and that is they recognize the complexity of the polypharmacy regimen that they're going to be faced with. They understand how that might impact things called geriatric syndromes like falls or memory impairment and delirium. And then they build a regimen that's based again on goals of care that focuses on what matters most for that patient. 
and we try as a priority to preserve functional status. And those are terms that you know you think of and become inculcated with if you're in geriatrics, but if you're not, you don't necessarily come to that understanding and appreciation of well, why do what does functional status matter? You know, if somebody can no longer bathe, toilet, groom, and feed themselves, that means they're no longer going to be able to be independent. And it's all about preserving that independence. So yes, you know, geriatric pharmacists typically are in those settings that you talked about. But it goes beyond that. I would also say that you know, in the VA system, there's a lot of geriatric pharmacists that work there that do home-based primary care, that are providing palliative care. I've done a lot of work lately in our system around palliative care. We need more pharmacists in that space. I also think that the work I do in population health is a perfect avenue for geriatric pharmacists because you are dealing, like you said earlier, mostly with a senior population and you've got the skill set now to be able to apply what you know in dealing with one patient across now a whole platform of patients. How do you make prescribing safer for a system for older adults? Sean, my, my follow-up question here, and as I think about the geriatric pharmacist and, and that approach, and you know, you yourself, board-certified geriatric pharmacist, I know there's a number of folks who particularly work in those types of settings. I, I think there's often a predisposition that it's based on some clinical knowledge that someone is qualified or effective to work in that area. But as you've spoken about it, and as we've talked to other guests in this series, I keep hearing a lot of the same callbacks to the access to care, uh, independence, or maintaining the independence, the action plan. As I think about it here, the it's, it might actually be the soft skills that are required, the interpersonal communication that are perhaps even more effective than the clinical skills for being a geriatric pharmacist. That's probably not where you thought I was going with this question, but would love to get your thoughts on the important dynamic of those elements. And, you know, that comes back to my time riding on an ambulance when you're sitting across from somebody on a gurney and they're in pain and you're trying to have a conversation with them or you're trying to understand what's going on. And, and those soft skills are really super important. So I'm glad that you highlighted that. Yes, there are definitely technical skills and regulatory um, awareness that you need to have, especially if you're working in that skilled nursing facility uh, population as a consultant pharmacist one of the most heavily regulatory regulated spaces that we have out there. But, you know, what you talked about, I think is as important when you're dealing with the individuals that are not in skilled facilities per se, but are still in an ambulatory space or coming into your community pharmacy, or you're the hospital pharmacist seeing somebody at the bedside, trying to understand what it is that you know, matters to them, trying to do a, a medication reconciliation and understand the meds that they may be taking. Those soft skills become critically important for you to not only connect with the patient, but then to be able to get the information that you need from them. And then translate that to the care team. Yeah, the translation part is going to be often the key. And uh, Sean, we'll move to our final question for geriatric pharmacy today. And it's something you brought up in your introduction, geropsychiatry. I'll admit that for myself, I haven't maybe seen or I've forgotten that I've seen it uh, somewhere before. But based on those combined root words, I think I've got a pretty uh, good idea on what is this concept. But would like to have you explain what is geropsychiatry? How is it being applied in current patient care practices? So you're right. You take those root words and you realize that this is a subspecialty of psychiatry that focuses on the challenges of diagnosing and managing mental health needs of older adults. So these are psychiatrists who complete a fellowship in geriatric psychiatry. And when I used to practice at VA Connecticut, I was part of the Geropsych Fellowship Training Program. So I spent a lot of time with those fellows. And I can tell you what's unique about geropsychiatry versus other aspects of psychiatry is that they get a lot of additional training and time and experience in how to safely use medications in older adults. And some of these medications are meds that we might otherwise consider high risk for that population. And they're focused on conditions that are very common in, in older adults. So think about dementia. And then the challenges that dementia presents, the behavioral and psychological problems associated with dementia, or what is unique about treating depression in an older adult? Is it depression that results from grief, from loss, or is there something else that might be driving that depression? And trying to get them effectively treated 
with medications may take longer, may take other aspects that you have to bring to the table, such as cognitive behavioral therapy and non-pharmacologic means. But that's what those geropsychiatrists are uniquely trained to do. They also will often partner with other specialties, such as neurology, around complex populations, such as Parkinson's, where there's going to be mental health components to managing that Parkinson's patient, but then there's also the physical manifestations of the disease that the neurologist is trying to deal with. So I would say that if you ever have an older adult that is in need of additional mental health support, try and find yourself a geropsychiatrist because they are truly um, well-suited and capable to to understand how best to to deliver that care and and oftentimes do it without medications in some cases. Yeah, thanks for the description, Sean. And, and as you mentioned, you know, for many of the medications that may be used, there, there can be an inherent risk around what are some of those quote unquote high risk medications for for that population. So it is, I guess, a fine line to walk. And it's great that we need to have the psychiatrist, but also for the you know pharmacist, the medication experts being involved with this process to really maximize the care and have an action plan for that patient that's going to be effective and it's going to produce the the intended results. So appreciate going into that description. Appreciate always us being able to shed light on a topic that may seem a little bit more niche, um, but it's it's ultimately important for for patient care. Now, Sean, with that, I, we are going to go ahead and we're going to close and wrap up our, our podcast, but you're not off the hook yet. Um, and we do appreciate your experience here and the information you've shared about geriatric pharmacists and healthy aging. Uh, but I do have two additional questions for you uh, before we close. Normally, it's just one, but you're, you're getting two. You're a special guest for today. And uh, the first item, I know you've been an active volunteer leader for various pharmacy organizations. You referenced your time with ASCP. Um, now, as well, you are a current board member, uh, a board of trustee member for the American Pharmacists Association. You've been involved also with local community leadership. And I just want to ask you and give you a bit of a platform here. Why do you feel pharmacists should be increasingly involved both with both professional organizations and also local community leadership? Uh, thank you, Nick. It, you know, if, if you don't get involved and become an active participant to stand up for our profession, who will? You're either part of the solution or you're part of the precipitate, as we say in pharmacy. And you can't wait and rely on somebody else to do this for you. Then you're just a passive bystander. You have no right to complain when things don't go the way you want them to. So get involved. Anything worth fighting for is worth the fight. And it's not that hard to get involved. It usually starts by saying yes when somebody asks you to get involved. And, and that's how my career began as I got involved locally. It's kind of come full circle. I, I had a lot of um, things that I did locally in Connecticut. I then got involved nationally with uh, the American Society of Consultant Pharmacists. That became a springboard to getting a bit more visibility into an organization that I didn't have as much experience with. As a pharmacy student, I'm sh ashamed to admit, I didn't belong to anything. I didn't join anything. I was just so focused on getting through school and I was working several jobs to try to pay for it. But it wasn't until I got my first paying job that I realized I really need to start getting involved. And it's because somebody, Michael Fortin, if you're listening, thank you, came to my office and said, would you come and join us at a board of directors meeting? We're having this group, ASCP, you're in geriatrics, we think it'd be great for you to get involved. And then I just took off. My career is now kind of coming full circle where I'm getting much more involved locally at the state level around policy and regulatory issues that pertain to the health information exchange world. And how do we get data to share and flow? How do we do med reconciliation appropriately and create a best possible medication history? How can an HIE or a PDMP be part of that solution? And ultimately, that then flows back to the work that I did in geriatrics around appropriateness of medications and trying to create a list that we all can agree to. But it gets down to if you don't get involved, you have no right to complain because we need you to get involved. Step, step up, step forward, put your name in. There is a spot for you. I guarantee it. And it's a lot of fun. You get to meet great people and make a lot of friends, you included, Nick. So wouldn't have had a chance to meet you if we hadn't served together in, in uh, APHA. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Sean, I go back to, you know, as you were saying, it's important for the involvement. I actually, one of my favorite quotes, if you're familiar with the TV show Scrubs, 
uh, and there's an episode in season four, one of the one of the doctors, their their quote to one of their colleagues is nothing in life worth having comes easy. And I, I think that's really just the truth. It's something that I hold myself to. And, you know, you articulate it in a, in a different way, but with really the same intent uh, for what we need to do. Uh, now, Sean, other thing I want to make sure to ask you about here. I happen to know that you are a big Star Wars fan. I know you've included reference to that in some of your social media activity and presentations and speeches. So I want to see here for you, how can you bring in Star Star Wars to our current state for pharmacy and leadership conversations. Is there something that you find especially fitting for, you know, where we need to move with pharmacy practice and patient care? Uh, yes. Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, I am a big Star Wars fan. I happen to be at that perfect age when the first movie came out. So I got a chance to grow up watching Star Wars throughout my life, like many people did with growing up with Harry Potter or other series. Uh, there are so many great lines to choose from, so where do I begin? Um, I thought we could try a trifecta of quotes, Nick. And I'm going to test your knowledge of Star Wars to see if you know who said them. So here's the first quote. Rebellions are built on hope. The second quote would be, I find your lack of faith disturbing. And the third, this is the way. So who are they? Any ideas? So the first one is rebellions are built on built on hope. I'm guessing Princess Leia. No, but that's a good guess. Okay, it is a female protagonist. Oh, Ray. Close, but this one happens to be Jin from Rogue One. We're going to go into the canon here. And the uh, second one, Vader. You got it. And the third one. Uh, the third quote. Remind me of that one again. That one is "This is the way." the Mandalorians in plural. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So very good. Two out of three. Not bad, sir. So why these three quotes? Um, so I feel pharmacists are rebelling against the standard quo. So that's the first one. And as much as I hear that hope is not a strategy, it's still a conscious decision. One that the profession needs now more than ever. And to those who don't believe will ever succeed in payment reform, as Vader says, I find your lack of faith disturbing. Because as Mando would say, this is the way. This is the way forward in the future of the profession. May the force be with you. Yeah, thanks, John. And I would note, I mean, even as we were talking before, pharmacist community, pharmacist involvement, there's a lot of things that we can have pharmacists doing. The system is not currently set up for pharmacists to do, you know, some of this work and and provide some of those services. So, yeah, there needs to be change with how we really recognize the value of pharmacy. And we're, we're going to get there. It takes, again, that active involvement for us to be you know involved. And, um, you know, one other item here and and, and Sean, I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of like you grew up with the first you know, Star Wars movies. It makes me somewhat excited. It also pains me somewhat. When when you say the first Star Wars movie, of course, my mind goes to Star Wars Four: A New Hope. But there's there's probably going to be listeners out there that say, "Oh, wait, he he grew up watching the Phantom Menace," and uh, that little bit of a different approach that's there. So just just to yeah, age no, we're us start a little we're bit. starting in the order in which they were released. So A New Hope. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, I, I'm I'm with you on that one, my friend. All right. Well, well, Sean, appreciate the conversation today, whether it be pharmacy, whether it be active involvement um, and volunteerism with the profession, or whether it be, of course, Star Wars. Uh, but with that, Sean, I do thank you for bearing, appearing on the show. And before we close, if someone wants to ask you a question about pharmacy, about leadership, or even Star Wars, how can they contact you? What's the best way to get in touch? So the best way would be for them to email me, I think. So that would be my first name. S-E-A-N dot last name, which is J-E-F-F-E-R-Y at UConn, which is U-C-O-N-N dot E-D-U. Easy enough. Well, Sean, thank you again for appearing on the show. And that does wrap up our content for today's episode. For our listeners, just a couple of final notes. Make sure you subscribe to our podcast. And if you have a question or topic, please let us know. Similarly, if you have a topic and would like to come on the show and talk about it, we'd love to hear about that. You can DM us directly on Twitter at Pharmacy Quality or by emailing info at pharmacyquality.com. With that, I appreciate you listening to the Quality Corner Show, and there is one final message from the PQS team. The Pharmacy Quality Solutions Quality Corner Show has a request for you. 
our goal is to spread the word about how quality measurement can help improve health outcomes. And we need your help in sharing this podcast to friends and colleagues in the healthcare industry. We also want you to provide feedback, ask us questions, and suggest health topics you'd like to see covered. If you are a health expert and you want to contribute to the show or even talk on the show, please contact us. You can email info at pharmacyquality.com. Let us know what is on your mind, what we can address so that you are fully informed. We want you to be able to provide the best care for your patients and members, and we wish all of you listeners out there well.